Hey everybody, this is Madhav here from the Remote Marketing Podcast. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to have Ilya Markov, a senior and a serial content marketer. Um, he is the, you know, he's the content marketing manager, Chart Mogul. Um, and, you know, I'm excited because it's almost like a reunion for both of us, you know. Um, for most of you who don't know, Ilya and I worked together at Hubstaff in its early years. Um, and then Ilya later went on to be part of a bunch of, you know, admirable remote companies like Groove, Animals, you know, and now Chart Mogul. Um, so I think it seems fair to say you've kind of mastered working with 100% remote teams, Ilya. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I think I think you can say that. Um, thank you for having me and uh, thank you for a stellar introduction. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, even though uh, Hubstaff feels like it's been a long while ago, uh, yeah. and I guess in the internet age, it's a long while ago, but um, <laughs> Like I still have very good, uh, very fond memories of that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It almost seems like three thousand years ago. Hundred percent agree on mm. that. Um, all right, Bert. Let's kind of let's start with your chart mogul days, right? I mean, it's like I think it's definitely one of the top companies, you know, for SaaS revenue metrics and all of that, right? So, can you kind of give me a little background of your day to day work, you know, as a content marketing manager, chart mogul, and you know how your work you know, basically impacts the, the company and the bottom line. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, as you said, uh, Chart Mogul is a great company and a great team to work for. Um, and like my days are spent mostly um, on the content side. So I'm like, the content is a hugely important channel for, for the company and like for pretty much every aspect of how we um identify and, and attract customers and like how we educate people to to use the product um, and, and so on. So uh, it's really important to not just uh, produce and publish content, but it's also really important to make it in a way that um, empowers the brand, uh, you know, like keeps the good reputation of the company. And of course, it's like very important to educate people on why it's important to keep track, understand, and use their uh, subscription data to um, to grow their businesses, their subscription businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So in, in, in terms of like day-to-day -day work, um, of course, there's like a lot of technical content work that needs to get done. Um, I'm also doing a fair bit of writing. Uh, I'm working with uh, guests, contributors, with people on the team who are also, you know, producing some content. Um, I'm working with the sales team, helping them um, like nail down their positioning and messaging better. Uh, sometimes they need help with uh, like sales enablement content that they can use in their, um, like in their work when they're talking to customers. Um, and of course there's like a whole bunch of things like uploading posts, uh, doing keyword research to make sure you're maximizing like all different ways to to use content uh, and all that got it okay and then like how big is the marketing team at chart mobile uh so we are now two people um mm -hmm. we had a head of growth who joined a few months ago um and before that uh, and and we also have a sales team which is like we used to be one big sales and marketing team um, reporting to the same director. And now that kind of, kind of got split into like a sales team and a marketing team. Mm -hmm. um, before that, it was just me, uh, like the, the, the lone marketer on the team. Um, and there's also like a, a big, uh, of course, that's not part of the like marketing team, but there's also a customer success team, which plays a huge role for, for us as well. Um, and now with two people, there's like a very big change, uh, because if you think about it, it's just one person, but it like the team gets doubled and that's mm -hmm. like, it never happens anymore with adding one person. Yeah. Uh, so now like it's, um, in a way there's like a lot more things you can do. And it's also very helpful that you have someone who's like always there to provide feedback, help with, like give you guidance on, on your writing or just like act as a sounding board. Yeah, 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 yeah. I definitely agree, you know, being a solo marketer, sometimes, you know, at a team, you know, uh, you, you've really got to kind of like, you know, give major props to those people, you know, like to just do everything on their own, just to be kind of like just being the sole 
marketer and the face of marketing. Uh, it's it's a huge deal. But right now, I mean, so so you said you know there's there's a sales department, there's customer success, there's marketing, um, you know, which which basically work together. So what is what's the goal of marketing in in this entire setup? Like, what are the you know KPIs that you guys are responsible for? Mm -hmm. Sure, great question. Um, I I think it's fairly common to what you see in most uh, software companies and like especially in SaaS uh, with marketing. So um, like brand building, um, you know, creating awareness about the brand and the product. Um, and of course, generating leads and demand um, is like what falls under uh, our, you know, our responsibilities. I mentioned sales enablement as well. Mm -hmm. um, but something that's uh, really interesting, uh, at least to me, is that we, so earlier this year, we launched uh, what we call the world's first subscription data platform. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, um, that's a bit of a long-term vision. It's, it's not just a long-term vision. they like, when we launched, there were actual things that we launched and then we've been adding more features to the product. Um, but it's also a bit of a long-term vision of what we want to do with Chartmogo, with the platform and how we see people using their revenue data mm -hmm. um, because they still like data in, in many ways, it's still a silo. Many teams still like maybe they're looking at metrics, but they don't really understand like what's underlying the data and how they can use the data. And we have this grand vision about like not just collecting all the information in one place and having a bunch of metrics calculated by, by a piece of software but actually this becoming like a central piece in the stack of the company, um, not mm -hmm. just for marketing, not just for revenue or like the CEO, the founders or revenue ops, but like everyone in the company. So let's say you can connect your data or your, your revenue data platform. You can connect it to your marketing automation tool and maybe execute um, some automated actions based on what's going on. Uh, mm -hmm. in uh, like maybe your customer reaches a specific um, MRR milestone and that fires an automated email that congratulates them on, on their achievement or something mm -hmm. like that. There, there are many ways um, to do this. Um, so this is the vision. Um, and earlier when we, earlier this year, when we launched <clears throat> the subscription data platform, <clears throat> we kind of figured out that this is, we're kind of creating a new category. So this is a very interesting challenge, um, at least to me, like um, explaining what that vision is and why people should care and like how this is a new new field that's emerging. Interesting. Um, I, was, I was actually just kind of like looking at your uh, LinkedIn description as well. And you, you mentioned that you kind of let the, the marketing campaign of this, this subscription data platform that you guys launched. Um, and, you know, that particular campaign kind of resulted in like a 4% growth in MRR. So like, wh what did you do on that? Like, how do you kind of, where is the campaign like for kind of marketing this, this new product? Um, so it's, it's interesting. I mean, they're, they're like tactical pieces to the campaign. Of course, there's like a bunch of uh, assets that you have to prepare, landing pages, um, you know, like emails, blog posts, um, mm -hmm. and things like that. But underneath it all, I think it's really important to understand um, what this new platform, this new product, this new category is, and then find the right messaging and the right positioning to explain it to the people who can benefit from it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's the real that's the real challenge with 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 a task like this. Um, so, I mean. I can talk about how we needed to write, write a bunch of things, uh, me personally, but I don't think that would be that interesting to your to your listeners or your viewers because they are doing it, probably doing it themselves anyways. Um, but finding that, uh, you know, that messaging is, is, the, is the interesting part. Um, right. And I think very big, very big, I'm sure that's nothing new to you or anyone listening to this, but it's like talking to customers is just so important. Um, 
So Chermogo is probably one of the my one of my first experiences writing case studies and like talking to customers to write case studies, and it's just so eye-opening. It's it's completely different when you talk to customers, and I've talked to a bunch. Um, some you know some some software products, some subscription boxes, and things like that. And it's very interesting how every customer has a completely different perspective of like the things they care about and how they perceive your your product. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 I completely agree that um, customers are obviously great to kind of um, you know get you insights and also kind of you know when they kind of start talking, um, you know, like start explaining your product, it's it's always. Um, that you can kind of take over into marketing, kind of do that. Um, and I think one of, one of my favorite questions when I kind of ask, uh, like there's a question that I read in some book, it was basically like, um, you know, explain our product in like five words, right? And that's the limitation there. And people would come with all sorts of things, you know, um, oh, you know, um, it, you know, takes care of my boring admin tasks and all of these different things. And I think taking that learning from, you know, customers using that terminology and kind of using that in your messaging, I think, really help so um so that's pretty awesome that you know you guys are doing that but you know like you mentioned right for this marketing campaign you know you've uh you, know, you, you created landing pages emails blog posts right and i've for, for example i'm i'm a i'm a subscriber to the newsletter the, the chart mogul i think is the three SaaS things you know every friday um and i think you know when i kind of look at chart mogul right now you guys have a bunch of things you know um, there's there's an email course, there's a weekly newsletter, there's a podcast, there's a resource section, there's a blog, you know, there's there's all of these different things, right? Um, so, you know, when you're kind of building on these initiatives, like what's what's the strategy? Like what's the end goal? Are you, you know, is, is the focus kind of build like this really highly targeted email list, which you can nurture over time to, you know, build customers um, or is there more to it? Um, and what else are you kind of planning um, on that front? Great question. Um, I think, at least where it comes to me, I think the main uh, goal um, marketers should have when, when they're planning initiatives and things like that is just to add value. Um, this is what I, this, in, in my opinion, this is what makes an impression and like where you can, because SaaS, SaaS marketing, you know, that it's so noisy. There's so much noise going on. Um, there's so much content. People are constantly trying new channels because, you know, as soon as something emerges, like two or three months later, it's like completely saturated. Everyone's using it. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you're familiar. Everyone's doing a podcast. Uh, everyone's writing like longish messages on LinkedIn and sharing those and trying to promote those. So people are constantly trying new things. And the one thing which I think will never change and will never become obsolete is just adding value. Um, and this is what we try with, uh, what we try to do with everything we plan and everything we do. Um, and I think, um, you know, when it comes to, if we're talking about content, for example, um, and I know like in marketing pretty much is everything is content nowadays. Uh, I mean, doesn't matter if it's like social media or video or audio or written, uh, it's like pretty much always content, you know? Um, and I think with, with that, one thing you can do is um, like you need to build some kind of competitive advantage to your content. And that can happen in, in my opinion, at least it can happen in one of two ways. Um, the first way is if you have access to some kind of data that not many, it's like not publicly available. Um, and this is what you see with like, um, trying to think of a good example, but let's say like a lot of the VC, VC companies, they collect data or they use some kind of like, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, repository I know what you of data that, yeah, yeah, yeah. that they have. And the other way is like, to do the work and like build something that's not easy to replicate. Cause I, like everyone can sit down, you know, with their laptop and write 5,000 words in, in a week or so, or like two days or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, actually, you know, doing the work to collect some data uh, or maybe like you run a survey. Um, I know, I think you like, you used to run, like you did a report on like, working remotely you ran a survey with remote workers a while back while you were still at hub stuff 
-hmm. I remember seeing that. See, now it's like, what, three, four years later, and I still remember that because you actually, like, you did the work. Um, yeah. And because that work is not easy to replicate, um, you know, it makes a dent. And people see it, they're interested in it, and they remember it. Uh, and that kind of gets tied back to the brand that participated in all that. Um, mm -hmm. So we are currently working on something like this. Um, I hope it will be out by the time, um, you know, this podcast goes live. Uh, maybe it is, maybe it's not, but it's, uh, it's similar. It's actually, we decided to look at, um, a large number of, uh, pricing pages, uh, mm -hmm. for SaaS companies and to like analyze those and see what are like some common trends, um, what we can learn about monetization strategy and how SaaS companies price their products mm -hmm. based on what they actually put on their pricing pages. Uh, and this has been in the works for quite a while. Um, you know, we like collecting the data, um, you know, cleaning it up, analyzing it and actually writing some, uh, you know, some mm -hmm. insight around it, uh, took us a while, but if it's, you know, it's a big initiative, but it's one that I'm sure can help us, you know, make that dent that I mentioned because people will, I hope will, will enjoy it and find it useful. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. And so I, I understand the brand aspect of, of course, uh, you know, we've also seen, you know, in the past, you know, someone did like a study or, you know, they did something cool, like, you know, Vistia did like this, uh, you know, 10, 100, you know, something like that. Basically, you know, if you were to kind of split out video budgets, you know, how would, you know, a product um, overview video look like, right? And you you always remember those things, right? So that makes sense from the brand yeah. point of view, right? But in terms of, um, let's say for example, you know, with the weekly newsletter that you guys run, um, mm -hmm. or with or whatever content upgrades that you have in the blog and everything, right? You're collecting these emails, right? Um, is the process like, do you just kind of pass on these emails to the sales team and, you know, they kind of, I don't know, do their sales enablement bit and kind of like nurture them in? Or do you kind of like nurture them to a point that they sign up for a, you know, an account and then, and then it you know, kind of goes over to the sales team um, or is the sales team completely independent of this? Like um, what's the, like, wh what are you doing with these emails basically? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I understand the question. Um, so I would say the newsletter is mostly um, uh, like a brand building asset at the mm -hmm. moment. So it's funny that you mentioned, you know, the three links, because this is what people associate with it. And this, mm -hmm. I think this is the, the value of the newsletter. Um, so the newsletter was started before I joined Chartmogul. And like when I came on the team, it was like one of the responsibilities that get passed to me, that got mm -hmm. passed to me. Um, and I, like, we changed some things around the newsletter. So we like worked on the template, refreshed the template and, and so on but we never changed the core, which is like the three best links. So we can put a lot more links, uh, but we don't want to, because I believe this is the main value of the newsletter. And it's actually what I hear from people all the time. Like people get back to me and they're like, I love the fact that I know it's coming on Friday, like Friday afternoon, or if you are in like Europe. Um, so morning, if you're in the States or like late evening, I guess, if you're in um, late afternoon or early evening, if you're in, in India or like somewhere in the like the mm -hmm. in Asia, uh, and like the predictability and the fact that it's like <clears throat> the simple value three links just the best links someone someone else has done the work of curating like going through uh, all these sources all these articles that get published on a weekly basis they've gone gone through that and they've just picked the three best for me. Um, and this is what we combine. We don't really like if someone signs up for the newsletter, we don't really, there's like a simple banner inviting them to try out chart mogul, but we don't do anything else than that. Mm -hmm. If we know that someone's like already a lead, so someone's already in our funnel and we see that they also subscribe to the newsletter, that's a signal to us that they're like engaged and they know us, they probably, uh, engage with the brand on a few occasions. Um, so this is a signal for us, but we don't like just, uh, you know, spam everyone who joins the, the, the newsletter and ask them to, to become uh, Got it. customers Got it. immediately. So we, we work with them. 
Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. All right. Um, and, um, all right. So, sorry, yeah. just just want to add something because you mentioned the cheat sheets as well, and I think they're they're a great resource. Um, and same with them. A while back, we actually decided to remove um, the 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 gate gateway so people don't even need to leave us their their email when they are accessing the cheat sheets because our our aim is not just to generate a bunch of like um emails of people who maybe just wanted to check out what the formula for churn is or whatever or for mrr mm -hmm. but we like we want to be helpful to people um and we know that being helpful uh and like uh, providing that value uh gives us benefit which we can then use with the people who are engaged the people who like they understand they need uh something like sharp mogul uh and they have like we have the goodwill with them to to work with them and to make them customers yeah, yeah it makes sense where's the word that you use cheat sheets well, what's that oh the cheat cheat sheets um so we have a bunch of like oh cheat sheets oh, yeah, yeah 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 a cheat sheet right 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 got it okay yeah, I was I was just thinking of something like, is that like a new content marketing term or something? But uh, it cheat sheets, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Um. Okay. Cool. All right. That makes sense. Let Let's move on to kind of um. You know. So let's let's kind of talk about um. You know, you you were kind of leading the blog uh and you know doing the content marketing bit, you know, at HubStuff and then you did the same thing, you know, uh, a similar thing at Animals and similar thing at Groove and you know, similar thing at Chart Mogul, right? Um, and so, mm -hmm. you know, you you're obviously you work with a lot of writers, you know, all of that. So let's kind of talk about that, right? Let, let's talk about the first thing. With all of these four companies' experience that you have, you know, managing their blog and everything, how do you find good and affordable writers? Like they're they're a rare, you know, I mean, they're, they're rare to find. Like most of the times, you'd find a writer, they'd be, you know, you know, asking for like a ridiculous rate, and then they wouldn't turn out to be that good. Or sometimes there'd be a good writer, but not a good writer on the business side. Or, um, you know, so what's your process? Like, how do you find good and affordable um, writers? And, and the reason I'm also asking this is because I think some of the writers that you kind of brought in at HubStuff, right? Um, I've actually, I've been working with some of those writers even today, like in 2020, like whichever company I was with, or if I was working with a consulting client, I worked with them because they were all so good. And a lot of those were actually hired by you. So what's your process? Um, so I think one thing we should start with before we get to the process is understanding, like you have to figure out what's so hard about, um, you know, finding good writers. So as you mentioned, I think you, like you made a great, um, you, you put it in a great way it so you need someone who can write well and writing is like a is a skill on its own and it's actually a pretty hard skill um so you need someone who can write well but you also need someone who like understands the topic they're writing about mm -hmm. so like you can have a great writer and if you ask them to write about um SAS metrics for example it's a complicated topic. I mean, everyone mm -hmm. can check the formula for a specific metric, but why is that metric important? How you can use it? There are many aspects. People ask different questions around, even around like the most basic metrics. Um, so, the, you know, finding that uh, combination between the two is actually, is actually pretty hard. Um, and as you mentioned, it's, it's a very competitive field. There are a lot of people who are doing writing. So it's like, uh, for for writers, it's usually hard to like to be a good writer and um, get a high enough uh, rate for your work. So many mm -hmm. people like maybe they join. I know. Uh, thank you for mentioning this about the writers that um, like we we found at Hubstaff. The funny thing is, a lot of them have actually moved. There's some I know now who like are in managerial positions in companies like HubSpot. Envision, I know a whole bunch of them moved to like other other positions and have been doing very successfully. And part of it is like they always, you know, the best always look for the like the next step to mm -hmm. to do. Yeah. Um, so it's I think it's like it's important to look for that you know that combination of the skill and the knowledge. You know, the knowledge about the area you're in, and then the skill. Um, and I think it's like finding. Good writers is a lot about 
just um, you know working with with many people mm-hmm. um, and it's it you know just trying different people giving chance to to many people and like finding the the best to work with because you know on on top of the fact that they need to know the topic and like need to be able to write well they like there's also the the personal aspect that you need people that you can work with mm-hmm. um and that's like adds another challenge to it um and i think it's um um sorry i lost lost my train of thought there for a second uh it's also uh, so finding them oh i was gonna say it's like managing writers is a very fine balance because you need mm-hmm. like if you try to, uh, okay, maybe you like a specific writer, but you have some issues with how they're writing. But if you're always rewriting everything they write, it's not going to be a very uh, like a very productive relationship, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, because you like doing the work several times, even if like they're fine with someone editing their their writing all the time. So you have to find the right balance between providing feedback that's useful to them and helpful and helps them improve uh, what they write and their writing skill mm-hmm. uh, but at the same time not like not redoing the work mm-hmm. um, and i know a lot of people like because writing is something that everyone does and um, in in many cases people get very like very tied up in the editing like once mm-hmm. they ha- have to edit someone else's writing they get very tied up in it. They start making too many changes. So you have to like, at the same time, allow the writers to keep their, um, like their style and their writing, but also give them the feedback that makes the writing better. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. So it almost seems like, you know, what you're saying is that in order for you to get to the, you know, the right writer, you'll probably have to go through maybe five or six or 10 or maybe three or, bad writers to be able to, I mean, not bad, but like, you know, uh, like you would have to go through some bad writers to be able to find a good one. A good one. It wouldn't be like, you know, you can just hire the, you know, the first good person and you, know, you just start working with them. It's got to be a patient search to find a good um, writer that kind of fits in your requirements in terms of subject matter expertise um, and, you know, affordability and uh, the quality of writing. Um, is that, is that yes. accurate? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um... I think one thing that helps, uh, like, especially remote companies, um, I don't very often see uh, companies who hire writers full time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's a good, um, I think it's a good fit. Actually, I think it's a, also a good fit for writers because many writers actually enjoy freelancing and like the, uh, you know, being independent and not being tied to just one, one company or one, one team. So I think that also helps companies um, make sure they like find the best people Mm -hmm. Um, because if you can like to go through five or 10 or however many writers, you, you cannot just hire them, you know, all of them full time and just give them unless, unless you have, of course, unless you have like you've raced around and you just want to, you know, drown the world in in more content on Mm -hmm. your blog. Yeah. Um, so I think it like starting uh, with a, like a freelancing, uh, relationship works pretty well. Uh, but then once you find writers you like, um, you should think about like, what is your way to keep them? Uh, Got it. so that might, that might be the point where you like want to hire them full time, understand what their like personal, um, priorities are like, do mm-hmm. they want to develop into maybe a product marketing role or do they Mm want to develop into like a growth role or sales role you don't know just talk to them figure out what they want and make sure you like you give them that path that they can um, they can follow right 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 almost like i mean if let's say you were to go back in time i think the i think the, the two writers that i remember that you know we we had a good time working with was i mean we were really impressed with their quality i think one was ash reed right I don't know where he is right now, but you know he was he was Buffer. pretty good. Oh, 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 all right, okay. He's at Buffer. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Ash and I, I don't know if there was another. I think there was another person, Jessica Green. Uh, do you remember this? Or maybe 
Or maybe no, I think maybe this person. After me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's kind of take someone like Ash, right? Like a brilliant writer, you know, really loved and everything. So if you were to go back in time and, you know, if you could kind of whatever correct um, or, you know, could do things better, you would have, um, you knew that this was a good writer. You weren't, you would have eventually moved towards kind of bringing a person like him or her full time um, or like at least figured out an opportunity where how can we retain them more? Um, because all of these good writers just go away. Is that, is that how you would kind of um, tackle, you know, when a good writer kind of comes in your team? Um, sure. I, I just want to repeat that. I think it's very important that you talk to them and understand what they want to like mm -hmm. do. Um, yeah. I think with Ash specifically, I think he's still like um, owning content for Buffer. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think he does a fair bit of writing still. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's something he enjoys and he likes to do. But I think many people who start in like writing content, they they don't want to do it like forever. So they right. see some kind of progression they want to develop into another role. Um, and I think that is important. I think it's important to work with with people like that and still keep them on your team. Even if like they need to move out of writing full time and maybe you need to bring another writer or you need to hire a bunch of freelancers. But still, I think having people on your team who can write well, doesn't matter like what role they're in, I think it's hugely important because yeah. writing and communication plays a very important role, especially on remote teams, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. for example, you know, at Chartmogo, I've actually, you know, on top of like writing for public facing, uh, you know, assets like blog posts and the newsletter and all that, I've actually worked on some internal uh, presentations and, and other things. Um, I'm currently working on a project helping the sales team with their like positioning and messaging, how like how they define the the, the personas and the ICPs and how they talk to them, and what kind of core messages they use. Uh, and and I think that's that's very important to have on the team. Uh, and even like if the person progresses and moves into another role. They can still like, let's say you hire a writer and they want to like work on product and they become product managers. Mm -hmm. They can still write very good, uh, you know, content on product management. Mm -hmm. And that's like, that's something that can be very useful to, to your team. Um, yeah. Now they're building expertise in another field. Remember what we talked about in the beginning, like having the expertise and the skill to write. So they have the skill to write, you know that. And now they're building expertise in another field to actually have a, a writer who's an expert in another topic and they can write about it. Yep, 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 yep. That makes sense. And I think it's, it's, it's almost very similar to kind of retaining good people as well, like be it any other function as well. Yeah, so let's, of course. Yeah. I mean, so let's kind of chat about um, really the, the, you know, finding good writers, right? So for example, Let's assume you know you're you you're joining a new company, right? Let's say you join Chart Mogul or you join Animals, and you hear, right? And let's say they don't they don't really have any writers as such. There's nothing, right? But mm -hmm. you have a responsibility to you know write up a lot of content, right? Of course, the best instinct would be to just go back, you know, with some of the writers you worked with, contact them if they're available, and then recruit yeah. them, right? But let's say you've got to like you your content needs are basically way more than the, the the number of writers that you require so you need to get hired new writers right so how would you go about with it like where exactly would you go to find these writers um and what would your process be like there um yeah great question um so of course i i would start with like the proven tested places like we work remotely um you know, there's a whole bunch of websites where you can post like a, you know, a, a job ad. What What um, are those websites? Could you kind of spin those? So I think we work remotely is probably like one of the best. Um, I've, I know, and like I've talked to other people and I think there's a bit of a, a consensus there that it produces the best quality of candidates mm -hmm. when you post like um, um, uh, an ad there. Mm -hmm. uh, also because it's like, I think it's part of it is because it's a paid site. So you have like companies have to pay to post there. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 it's not overwhelmed with like random 
uh, mm -hmm. you know, a very high number of um, uh, announcements and job uh, posts. Uh, so that helps. And I think people pay attention to it and they check it regularly. So it produces uh, high quality candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you can use Angels List, you can use Upwork, you can use Fiverr. Um, you know, Upwork and Fiverr will probably generate a very large quantity of uh, candidates and like maybe the quality won't be as good. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, so that's one way. And I think it also it's important when you're using these sites, it's important to do the work. So make sure you put um, something together that really explains what the company is like, what people can expect. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, another thing that's usually smart to do is to ask the people, the candidates to do some work just to mm -hmm. show that they are like serious about uh, and not just, you know, firing applications to every opening yeah. that can be their way. Uh, but you also have to do the work and like show what the team is like, what you value, what the process is going to be like, so they know what to explain. This will, you know, doing this will help you because it like, it will also convince the people who you want to apply and like the serious people, it will convince them that it's worth yeah. applying. Yeah, makes so sense. that's one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also like use places like um, Indie Hackers or Hacker News and post there uh, and ask people to apply. Even Reddit, there are like some Reddits where you can do it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to you know advertise in as many places as possible, just because mm -hmm. you want to like get the largest pool of, of uh, talent that you can. Um, and then uh, one thing that I think works well nowadays is actually the like communities on on like slack communities where you can uh, participate and and like post and um uh you know advertise and connect with people uh, mm -hmm. and i would say that in some of these communities i would actually go as far as to suggest that you should like join some of these communities which target writers and content marketers and mm -hmm. like see the people who are there, so see who's active, like what people are saying and like how they're participating in community and actually reach out to some of these people and ask them, hey, are you available to like do some writing on the site or do you want to join my team if this is what you're looking for? So mm -hmm. just um, go as far as to suggest that you, you should do that and like Got find it. the people and just talk to them. Do you know any any particular Slack communities right now that you know that are kind of writers and content marketers focused that you'd recommend? Yes, sure. Uh, and I'm actually gonna check uh, Slack if I'm, I'm on a bunch. Uh, so there's the um, uh, so Jimmy Daly, who's mm -hmm. uh, at Animals, and he's now started his own thing, Superpath, which is mm -hmm. actually looking to to help uh, content marketers and writers. He has a Slack community, which I think is open to like, mm -hmm. everyone to join. It's not paid and it's, uh, it's very good. I would suggest people check this out if they're interested in, in, uh, in that. Um, but there's like, there's another one which is called uh, content team leaders, co content mm -hmm. team leads. Um, and uh, another one is, uh, which I think is a good one, but it's more like of a, general growth community and it has channels for writers and content marketers as well that's um, demandcurve.com mm -hmm. yeah they're a company who provides training and uh, courses for like growth growth mm -hmm. marketing and growth marketers um, okay. yeah so I, I would say these are these are pretty good pretty good Got uh, it. then um, another good resource is the seo playbook uh, which is a course by Robbie Richards. And it mm -hmm. also like, if you join the, if you buy a course from him, you like, he also invites you to, um, uh, the, the Slack community, which is, which is, it's more on the SEO side, I would say, but it's still a pretty good, uh, mm -hmm. community for, for writers and content marketing. Got people. it. Got it. And so kind of hiring writers from these Slack groups is something that you've done in the past and, and you've, you've found some decent writers from there. Uh, probably a while ago, to be honest, I'm, I don't remember very well, but it's like, even if you go on one of these communities and you ask, people will suggest writers. And I think uh, like, you know, getting a personal suggestion is actually something that, that helps. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I agree. I agree. 
So, uh, and so like, let's talk about once you've kind of gotten all of these writers, right? Um, just like how you, how you mentioned earlier, right? You'll have to go through a couple of bad ones to be able to find the good writer, right? So how do you vet through these writers? Yes, you can kind of put in a great job listing. Yes, you can reach out from all of these high quality communities and everything. How do you kind of vet through them? Do you like, do you have a process? Like you just give them a piece of work, see, or do you kind of look at their past work, ask them for their top three best articles, um, you know, for a particular niche? Like what, what do you usually ask a new writer before actually giving them a paid contract? Um, so yes, I, I, the first thing, so I always ask to see like some uh, samples of work they've done, like usually it's the work they're most proud with. So mm -hmm. it's like, you should be, it should be good work, of course. So I think that's always very, very helpful, like to read what they've written. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure it's like, not, not, uh, you know, something very, uh, you know, something very surprising to hear. Um, one thing I pay attention to very much is how they communicate. Uh, so mm -hmm. how, like how timely they are with the emails, do they respond like in a timely fashion? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't expect people to reply to an email within five minutes of sending it, mm -hmm. but like, do they reply in a timely fashion? Um, uh, how organized their emails are, you know, mm -hmm. as a writer, communication is your work. And if you are not communicating well in your emails if they're like very long and confusing that's not a great sign but if mm -hmm. like if you're writing well in your emails that's always a good sign um, and then what i do is um i try to explain the process in as few words as possible so mm -hmm. i'm like usually saying something like okay here's a topic i usually keep a few topics at hand just to you know be able to mm -hmm. give the writers a topic to work on immediately. Uh, and I say, okay, my process looks like this. Um, please send me an outline. Uh, I'll provide some in like on Google Sheets. Uh, I'll give you some feedback on, on like the, on Google Docs, not Google Sheets. Mm -hmm. I'll give you feedback on your outline. Uh, and then please write the first draft. I'll give you feedback on the draft. And then uh, maybe there'll be a second route of, of, of feedback or not uh if like if everything looks all right um and and that's it and i make myself available for for any questions got it, uh, got it. and then i again again i you know see how they work so what kind of outline are they giving me are they just is it you know a good line? usually what i expect to see in the outline is you know uh, i call it it's like the 50 percent stage so after mm -hmm. you write the outline the article should be done on 50 percent uh, because you know what you're going to write in it. Mm -hmm. um, and the first draft is usually gets it to 90%. So if you, mm -hmm. go, if you give me a good outline, um, that's a great sign for, for the writer as well. But of course, that's just my process. I mean, you know, maybe for other people, there's like a, something that works better. But I've Got actually it. seen that this works pretty, pretty well with the people I work with. Got it. So for every content piece, the your outline is usually like one page. Like how much time do you spend on an outline before kind of giving it to a writer? Like how detailed are these outlines? Well, I usually expect the writer to come up with the outline unless it's something like we have a story that we want to tell and then we produce the outline Got internally it. and then we give it to the writer. Okay. But most often it's the writer who's actually coming up with the outline as well. Okay. But when I'm writing, when I'm writing, um, so if the, if, if the outline is 50%, then I would make the case that you have to spend 50% of the total time you're working on the article on the outline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then 40% on writing the first draft because this is like getting it to, to the 90% of got being it, done. Got it, got it. Okay, all right. And then I'm, I'm like, you know, when you're kind of working with these writers, you also, you know, tend to kind of give them like a brief, you know, that here's the keyword you want to write for, you know, here are some competitor articles. What does that brief usually contain? Like, what do you usually give them um, to make sure that, you know, you've covered all bases for them to kind of get started uh, in terms of writing? Um, so I think uh, maybe, not sure if it, I think it was Hubstaff. We actually had a like template for the brief. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to impress on people that it's important to nail down your process, especially if you're working with other people. So for example, with Chart Mogul, you know, I'm the sole, or oh, used to be the sole marketer. Now I'm like doing most of the writing. So I don't need all these 
process doc style guides, you know, all these mm -hmm. things, because a lot of the things I know. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, it's just me, so I don't need to refer to documentation to, to know how to do them. But mm -hmm. if you're working with other people, and especially people who are like freelancers and they're not part of the team and you cannot just, you know, tap them on the shoulder on Slack and talk to them any, any time of the day you want, mm -hmm. um, I would say that having this, uh, uh, like a brief template, a style guide, a content calendar, I think it's super important just to make sure. I know it uh, can be tedious, it can be annoying to set aside all this time in the beginning to, to produce them. But once you do it, um, it's like it's going to save you a lot of time down the road, especially yeah. when you need to like go through several writers. And instead of explaining the same thing to five people, just put it in a document or record a video that works better and just share that with them. Got it, got it. Uh, so in terms of like a, a brief, um, I agree. I usually my process looks something like if we are writing something that's targeting, uh, you know, ranking on Google organic traffic, I would start with identifying a keyword that I believe we should produce content for, and then going to Google and seeing what ranks for that keyword, mm -hmm. and then put that put that in the in the um, brief. So tell them, okay. When people, so for example, now I'm working on a blog post about M MRR, monthly recurring revenue. So that's mm -hmm. why it's top of my mind. <laughs> but when you go to Google and you search for MRR, you see that people ask uh, questions like, how do I grow my MRR? So, yeah. okay, this is, this is something that needs to go in this piece of content. So put that in the brief. Um, then another thing that um, if you don't have it as a style guide, uh, I, I would encourage people to put this in their style guide. But if you don't have a style guide, just put something in the brief around like the, the voice and the tone. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to sound super professional and like risk sounding boring as well? Or like how much humor, how much, you know, light hearted style is, is fine. Mm -hmm. um, things like that. Okay. All right. That makes sense. And then what's like your preferred place for kind of managing these writers is, is the central point mostly, you know, your, your email um, or is it like a Trello board or is it like a Google Sheets, an Airtable? What's, what's, what's the central writer management place for you? I'm a big fan of Trello. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been using it forever. I'm, I'm sure you still remember our yeah. uh, Trello board from, from Hubstep. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think Trello is very powerful because it's, um, it's simple and it has all the features that you need to do this work well without mm -hmm. it becoming too complicated. Um, Airtable is also a great, um, great option. And especially if you want to build more complex workflows that do different things, uh, it's, it can be very, very powerful. I've seen some really impressive things done with, with Airtable. Mm -hmm. um, lately, what I find, I've been finding very useful as well is um, Notion. Notion mm -hmm. is actually a great oh, tool yeah. because it combines like you can you can have a Trello board and all your content like the repository of your content and all your process documents in one place. Mm -hmm. uh, while with Trello, you can still have them on Trello, but they will new like, like your style guy would need to live um, in a Google Doc or something like that. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. Be linked, be linked I, from Trello. I agree. I love Notion. Like I mean, it's just it's just so nicely built. One hundred percent agree on that. Um, let's kind of talk about, you know, one of the final things about, about writers, which is pricing, right? Um, what do you, so there are two aspects of it. One is what is the type of pricing that, you know, when you're working freelance writers, what do they charge? Is it per word? Is it, uh, you know, for a particular, you know, uh, you know, for a, for a certain style of articles or is, is there different things? And the second thing is, what is the right price to pay for a good right? I know it's a very, very broad question. You know, it can range from as low as ten dollars to maybe a thousand dollars for a thousand word piece, right? Um, but really, what is the good price? Let, let's get to the first question. Like when you've worked with writers, what are the kind of pricing you know that that writers kind of bring up with, and like what's the best way to deal with them in terms of uh, the, the type of pricing? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so. I, my feeling is that most people charge per project. So it's not even like per word, but it's more like per project. So mm -hmm. they would say something like, 
usually people have um, maybe two separate prices. Uh, they mm -hmm. have like a shorter post, a price for a shorter post, and then like a quote for a longer piece or something like that. But I think what, and I've seen this actually some companies, very few companies actually, I think in my experience, just one mm -hmm. um, that pays writers per hour. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that's something that you should at least consider because with pricing, so for me, it's two things. I want it to be fair to both the writer and like us, the company, if mm -hmm. I'm like managing the, 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 the content for the comp for a company. So it needs to be fair, not just for like a few good factor, but also because if it's not fair, a good writer will always find, you know, another opportunity or like higher payment. Mm -hmm. So you want it to be fair. So they feel, you know, like they're getting a, what they deserve. Um, and like, you don't have to think about it or discuss it all the time. Like, mm -hmm. But at the same time, the other thing is, when you focus on quality, sometimes, you know, it's not as simple as just to write an outline in the first draft and a second. Draft. Uh, it doesn't always work that way. So sometimes you need to go back. Sometimes it would be something like, okay, we already have this piece of content, but we need to add something to it. Um, so in, in these cases, I think, um, you know, you either have to consider some kind of like per hour or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or if it's a really good writer and you're very happy with their work, think about bringing them, you know, on the team, either part-time or full-time, whatever works for, for both of you. Mm -hmm. Just to make sure you have this, uh, like, this freedom to focus on the quality without, like, having to discuss all these details. Um, yeah. So okay. I think that answers, like, the first the first part of the question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. And, th and then let's talk about... The pricing. Like, what is the you know you said you know it should be fair pricing for both the writer and the and the and the employer, right? And the um, oftentimes, and this is something that a lot of people also kind of email me and ask you know that uh, you know I don't know what the right price is to you know pay for a or, you know pay for a writer. Like how much should I be paying for a thousand word article, right? So let's kind of take that as a baseline. Based on your experience working with writers, what's the average price, and um, you know what's the range like, and you know like what do you feel is a fair pricing for for a thousand word post, even though I understand that it's it's a, it's a really wide spectrum. Yeah, it's it's super wide. <laughs> uh, one thing I would say, if, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So if someone quotes you, I know the people who quote you. 10 bucks for a thousand words. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get great thousand words. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure probably on something like Fiverr, you can find this kind of price probably because I know people have this, uh, like they advertise uh, like mm -hmm. this. But like you get what you pay for pretty much. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in like, it really depends on the field as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm sure there are a lot more people who can write about travel than mm -hmm. software. <laughs> uh, yeah. But usually, like in SaaS, in SaaS, you see 4,000 words. You can go between uh, $150 to let's say 500 for really like premium premium writers, mm -hmm. um, or like even I don't know, maybe five, even 500 sounds too high. But mm -hmm. I would suggest that people figure out what they can be paying uh, and and to do that um, just look at um, what kind of customers you uh, content is attracting mm -hmm. you and i want to you know make a caveat here you never figure it out 100 percent uh how much customers content is contributing uh, mm -hmm. because you know i mentioned brand like brand recognition and brand building Content plays a huge role in that, and there's absolutely no way to measure that. Uh, so maybe someone comes, like sales, if you have a sales team like in your company, sales closes a customer, and that customer gets attributed to sales. But that customer, like their first exposure to your brand was through content. Yeah. You most likely won't capture that, but it's still there. But in many cases, you can capture it. And once mm -hmm. you know what kind of customers you're attracting from content, you know, the customers who are attributed to your content channel, 
um, find out what's the lifetime value of those mm -hmm. customers. Let's say your average lifetime value for a customer who came through content is, um, uh, let's say, six hundred mm -hmm. uh, dollars. Um, if we, you know, there's like the um, three times CAC equals LTV. If we follow that formula, which people often mention uh, in SaaS, that means you can pay 200 bucks for an article. And even if it just, if even if it gets you just one customer, mm -hmm. um, then it's fine. So just mm -hmm. find that, like find what your, what your um, range, um, because otherwise you get into like, even if you have to, to make the decision yourself, you get into like a discussion with yourself thinking about, okay, what's fair? Like, is mm -hmm. it fair to pay 300 versus 250? Um, I like this person better, but they're asking for hundred bucks more than this other person. And then it's a, it's a, it's not a great way to make a managerial dis decision. I think mm -hmm. basing it on, on like data and like having a, you know, making a data driven decision, I think is always a better option and a better yeah. idea. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. All right, that was, uh, I think that was super insightful. Like, it shows that, you know, you've had a huge experience in uh, in that. And, you know, working, you know, with all of these writers from across the world, um, which is amazing, right? So kind of just, you know, to cap it off, right? Like, and uh, kind of end the episode. If, you know, companies, you know, if, if CMOs of anyone listening to this podcast wants to, you know, follow your work or get in touch with you, how can they do that? Um, probably the best way is just to follow me on uh, Twitter. Uh, my handle is, um, it's actually, I think it's pretty long, but if they just look for my name on Twitter, I'm sure they'll find me Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, if someone wants to connect, uh, ask a question, it's, it's both are fine, of course. Um, and I'll suggest if they're interested in, in SAS, they sign up for the SAS roundup. Uh, which is the weekly newsletter we publish at, at Chartmogul, which collects just three links from from the week uh, that covers SaaS. Um, yeah, those 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 are the best things I would say. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would definitely the newsletter is pretty awesome. So I would definitely urge the the listeners to also check it out. But Thank cool. You. All right. Thanks a lot, Ilya. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, it was a real pleasure. Really enjoyed. All right. It. Okay. Thanks a lot.